What's up guys, Doug Polk here, and you're about to watch a 30 minute clip from Nick Petrangelo's new tournament course, High Stakes MTT Sessions, which is now available on upswingpoker.com. Hope you guys enjoy. Hey guys, it's Nick. Uh, today in this video, we're going to go over some early stage tournament play. This session is from the most recent scoop series. And in the top right, we've got a 500 scoop eight max. That's the uh, mid-level buy-in version of the 5K here, which was the high roller. And then we've got two daily 1Ks that happen on uh, on stars every Wednesday, a little bit bigger, a little bit tougher during scoop, and a 500 bounty here in the top right. So we're really gonna focus on the early stage play in these uh, mid and higher buy-ins. Uh, we've got some really deep stacks to start this one. Uh, we're playing 200 deep. This is like 100 deep and 50. Uh, and also 50. So we've got a bunch of different stack depths and a bunch of different interesting tournaments. And uh, we've got Doug here helping me out today. He's going to help me figure out uh, some if I made some mistakes in this session. We'll discuss any interesting hands that come up. We'll get his opinion too. So happy to have him joining me on this video. Uh, it's been pretty lonely by myself for a lot of these. So he can, he can help me uh, get through this one. All right, sounds good, Nick. Yeah, uh, I like to I like to jump in and, and kind of offer you know my insight and maybe give a little bit of um, some outside opinions. I, I I know when you're put when you're creating so many hours of content, sometimes it's good to get a little refreshing outside voice into the mix um, for both Nick and for you guys at home. So uh, yeah, I mean this is good. Like this is like cream of the crop tournaments here. You know, we're looking at like the mid to high stakes poker stars buy-ins like th this is uh these are gonna be like the toughest tournaments that there are online period basically um and so we should get some some good spots i mean i'm looking at the tables and i already see a bunch of names i know here like zero human zero uh, obviously goes way back uh greenstone um those are the two that i, I think initially jumped out at me but uh, i'm sure we're gonna see a lot of the same players in some of these tournaments and uh, i'm looking forward to what we get into yeah we got big fox in there too on, on one of the most legendary heaters of all time. He's right here, so Alex Foxen. Um, uh, which, which, which screen name is that, sorry? Right here. Right here we go. We'll see. Oh, okay. If you play online these days, you always see Big Fox. No one puts in more, gotcha. volume. No one puts in more volume than him. So. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, let's get into it. I think uh, we should have most spots. So, yeah, right off the bat here, just two quick preflop things. Ace-10 off. We almost never won a three-bet versus, uh, like, under the gun eight there. And we're just gonna make the uh, make the call with that one most of the time. The queen ten, we're just gonna min raise into two twenty blind stacks. So now we're in a single raise pot here. <clears throat> I would really like to see myself bet like quarter pot when I have ace ten off with a diamond and just check this one. Um, but I do think people have a tendency to over c bet in single raise pots out of position and under slow play and under option for the check raise. So I think that's something that happens quite a bit in against your uh, average like $500 MTT regular is that you can overstab um, for small size in position because they under check raise uh, as the, with their value hands, like I think queens, kings, aces, uh, people don't find the check raise often enough. And also they under check raise stuff here like ace four of diamonds or, or uh, sorry, like uh, ace five of hearts type stuff. Like when they find their set blocker with a backdoor, they don't bluff with it enough. So I think it's fine to bet too often when check to, but this one's a bad combo. And I think I remember making the mistake here. Yeah, you know, one of the things that kind of sticks out to me when I see this ace 10, uh, like I, I feel like these are cards that we really want our opponent to have. Um, so I don't really like, you know, our, our removal. Uh, from like an equity standpoint, I don't hate this. You know, obviously we're gonna get some like pretty reasonable rounds to go for it, and uh, when we do get check called, um, we're we're gonna have a, a decent chunk of equity. So yeah, you know, it, it, it's hard for a bet here to ever be that bad. Uh, but I do think maybe this would be a kind of like a, a low a low frequency play where I'm looking to, to mainly check and, and maybe maybe take a stab on some later streets. Yeah, it's just we're also just against up against a really early uh, early position raiser, like you said. Uh, you know, we want him to have some check folds. Um, and yeah, we just don't have, I'd rather have a diamond and yeah, like I said, not so bad, but kind of probably a little bit of a sloppy mistake there. Um, and then once we're, once, unless we get a great run out, like a queen X, king X, which isn't even that great, we're going to give up on that one. We're obviously going to give up, uh, the middle table here, 
we don't check when we're the single razor in position in 20 blind pots you just never check ace high boards it's actually zero so you end up doing a lot of linear betting with a hand like this which i think is kind of actually an interesting concept that maybe cash game players that aren't used to playing different stack depths um or just tournament players that haven't done a bunch of solver work kind of see like a 10 or a pocket eights here or whatever and they're like oh that would make sense to check but you actually just do zero checking with your range because of how how well you're doing on ace high boards button versus big blind when the big blind is shoving like every offsuit ace um, do you think uh, are there any spots where maybe exploitatively uh, exploitatively you might look to kind of mix that up and, and possibly put some checks in or do you think there's not enough merit to that instead of just betting everything I think it's a really good point to bring up because like I know that myself um, because I'm used to playing against people that have really well constructed c betting ranges when they check back in spots that are nearly pure c bet spots I tend to just like really go for it until proven otherwise um, because usually it's kind of exactly what you expect. Like if someone does happen to find the check back here, it's usually like Kings or nines. And if they happen to find a check back on like a Jack nine, nine, that's almost a really heavy C bet. It's almost always tens. Um, so when you do see the check back, it's usually not something tricky. Like here, it's usually not ace five from a really great regular. It's usually if the range gets to check, like, 5% of the time, it's usually one of those hands that falls exactly within that category. Um, so I find myself probably going for it way too much uh, against checkback. So I think, yeah, at equilibrium, you just want to do so much betting because you're still opening a lot and you just want to get a bunch of these folds. And ace 10 6 with a flush draw is just so good for in position because out of position, his purest defense are the suited portion of the grid, which now two suits have like automatic folds that unless they made a pair, right? So he never is going to shove like all the bad suited stuff. He's going he's gonna to defend even stuff like as strong as king queen suited. So the stuff that he always has pre is the suited stuff. And then the stuff that he always shoves is the offsuit ace. Uh, and then he has a bunch of like high low offsuit type stuff. So it's just so good for us when we're still opening probably like 45% into 220 blind stacks to just get the auto fold. So we have to bet range. But when you want to just force someone to over bluff or like try to just be tricky and pick them off, I think it's a good exploit. Okay. Makes some sense. What do you think about Ace 10 on the river? Uh, are we possibly considering uh, a bet check bet here? Or is this just never going to end up in that line? I think what happens there, I was thinking, I remember considering that is just like we're going to run into nines, sevens, tens a decent amount um and i think that that's a those are good hands to target because we would have like our ace jack off our king jack off king jack suited types that just like at this spr aren't looking to put in a bet on the turn really on that turn card that often so i think it's really credible uh to do to go bet check bet here and i think that those hands would be worth about pot um like the ace jack king jack and I think that our cards are actually really good in terms of like what we would be value betting. We would be having like Jack 10 of hearts, ace, Jack of spades. So like in terms of the way our bluff cards match up with some of our value, I think it would be all right. Um, definitely not one we want to go for every time. And I do think that out of position is incentivized to play a lot of his best value hands uh, for a check raise here. Like all of his sets and flushes, I think uh, we'll mix a really high frequency check raise because they're worth more than just betting like 80% or 100% pot now and getting called and they're really comfortable going for a check raise. Um, and they only some of them want to like bet 2K and try to induce a raise because on this line, you're just not inducing value raises from me very often. So I expect him to check a bunch when he has good value for that reason, for all those reasons, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think that he's going to check here pretty polar, meaning like he's not going to block bet sixes through tens. Um, and he's going to have some of his best flushes that want to check raise and his boats. Uh, so I think when, when we're facing a polar river spot like that, we can just comfortably value bet for like pot or 80% pot with some of our best one pair hands and just pretty comfortably... Uh, maybe our bet call for our bluff catcher is going to be like 
king jack or ace jack with a diamond and then we can just bet fold the others and we we have some bluffs like this one that will bet fold yeah that uh, makes sense yeah. i, I kind of like uh th this hand seems like one of our better hands to bet uh, as well as king queen i think the other one sort of sticks out to me um from a removal standpoint where you know we, we do have um we do block um some of the we block him from blocking our value bets. I don't know exactly what the best way of phrasing that, but yeah. So like you know, we could have we're more likely to have king jack, queen jack mm -hmm. uh, in those spots. Uh, and additionally, I think you know I do think if our opponent has tens here, I don't think that you know we're going to be getting off of tens uh, anyway. So uh, I think having a ten might even be a, a decent card here as well. So uh, yeah, it makes sense to me. It's a low frequency play. It's not something you want to be going for too often. I also yeah. think that. You know, I, I'm not sure the way that you're constructing your bet uh, versus Miss C bet opportunity, but uh, I'm not sure I would be putting all of my top pairs into just a one-fourth pot size. So we have to also think about like, you know, what what lines are those ending up in? Um, so the, the the more I'm check the more I'm betting that size with top pairs, the more I think I'm willing to go for it with hands like Ace Ten here. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, definitely on a Jack Five Four with a flush draw, uh, we're gonna want to have some big size with some of our best top pairs for sure. Um, so and if we did happen to call queens or something pre-flop, that would go into a big size on the flop almost always. So I think we can't really say we have queens here. Uh, the good thing we have going for us is we might have uh, some four x and some some pocket eights when we bet quarter pot. Like our, you know, maybe ace four of spades sometimes puts in this weird like linear or whatever, or ace four of uh, clubs puts in like a protection bet on the flop. Not super frequent, but yeah, we. When we small size, we have some of the other stuff that's not so polar, and we don't. We have less top pair. I agree, uh, but I don't think I. Uh, I don't go for it on this one. I don't. I don't remember. Uh, we do get check raised, so yeah, that's. We're probably it's probably such a good play just because winning the pot from, ace queen and ace king is a big equity win for us, and we probably they probably can't call very often. Especially ace queen and ace king of hearts are probably going to play like that every time. And I had the ace of spades, so probably missed out. I probably didn't roll enough on that one. I don't think I gave myself much of a frequency to bet it. Um, so we get check raised here. And I think that since from a good regular that knows what's going on, like we talked about that c-bet range, we're going to face a check raise a lot at the stack depth. His check raises are going to come from... He does, even though like he's this short, he does have the suited aces that he's going to call basically up to ace nine suited probably. You probably only want to start shoving the suited aces that are actually like for value, right? So like if he shoves ace 10 suited and I call ace nine off, that's pretty sweet. But there's not much merit to shoving something like ace eight suited. Uh, and also since you want to shove the offsuit combos because they don't play as well post flop. And then like once you get to ace 10 or ace jack off, it's just a value shove. Um, and like your ace seven, ace eight, they call sometimes, but your lower ones don't really play well post flop. So he's gonna draw from those suited aces, the uh, like ace two through ace eight suited to check raise here and not really play that many calls with them. So he's got that. He's got his like some of his, uh, you know, club seven, eight with an eight of clubs, eight, nine with the club types, um, some back doors uh probably some really aggressive stuff maybe like king of clubs eight stuff like that a little bit lower frequency so in any case i have a pure continue here versus this um and i guess it's a little bit uncomfortable with this spr but like when you're playing this c bet strategy you just kind of have to you're gonna you're gonna be in these spots where you see bet really wide and continue really wide and uh this one you're just never gonna fold especially with the club and the backdoor broadway yeah, I mean when you're when you're betting one fourth pot uh, and you're betting your entire button open range and you've got one of your best second pairs, I don't think you have to uh, go too deep to find a call here. Yeah, no, that's pretty <laughs> pretty easy. Um, and you expect these to be one and done a lot because this this check raising range, it's it's awkward to keep bluffing when they get a brick. Um, you know, like seven eight with a club just can't do that much on a queen. Like you just it's just they get they get kind of frozen on the turn a lot, but it is good. I think his size is like way too big. Um, you know, it's hard to think of reasons to make it this big out of position when you already, when you only started the hand with 20 blinds. <clears throat> I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe he's, um, creating a size where like, if he's check raising some flush draws, he can call it off. I, I yeah, 
I, I'm not I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, I, uh, but yeah. I think it, I think the one thing that we that the reason why you want to go a smaller here is just because like for starter we already talked about it. You're pretty linear with your ace x. Like it's not like you have two pair plus or something. Like you're check raising like ace four or whatever. And then on top of that, you want to leave yourself playability to like maybe make some block bets on the turn and get some folds from floats, right? Like if I float something like eight, nine of hearts and the turn is just a four of spades, he can put in like a 30% bet if he makes it smaller. And I'm kind of in a really bad spot there where I, when he makes it big, he's making in positions decisions on the flop and the turn a lot easier in my opinion. Like you don't need to go, you don't need to make everything as simple as two street game where like when you have a flush draw here, you just check raise big enough so you can shove for pot on the turn. You're gonna check raise so many different draws you want a little bit of playability on turn, so you want to have like close to a min raise here and then maybe close to like a 30 or 35% pot raise. And then that gives you ability on the turn to like bet quarter pot and get some folds or bet quarter pot and get a call and still bluff it off. Like give yourself options at low SPR. Don't just get pigeonholed into making your hand easier to play because you want to avoid decisions later on. Yeah, I guess the only thing I can say about this is that, uh, you know, when he risks, so he's risking six to win, to an eight here. You're going to have to do um, a good chunk of continuing and you're betting everything on the flop. You are still going to have to float like probably a few of your gutters, like your stronger ones. So I think it does like um, – or if, you're going you're to have to float some some of your draws here basically. Yeah, for sure. Like, and, and so it does it does make it maybe for people that are going to play very straightforward in this situation. Maybe that size really kind of kind of goes after that. Um but it, yeah, like I, I mean, I agree with you. I think a smaller size makes more sense. But I, I could see some players maybe not floating um, some of their occasional like king queen king jack type of hands. Yeah, and also yeah, yeah, I agree. It makes my defending. Well, yeah, I think when he makes it smaller, it makes it even harder for me. It's in some ways because then I'm like, okay, what do I do with king eight of hearts now or whatever? You know, like it's. I think it's at this SPR, it's probably more beneficial for your your range to like we said like leave more playability and make the decision harder against like the fringe continues then kind of make it cut and dry like okay you have king of clubs queen king of clubs jack cool you can continue you have eight nine with the club maybe you continue sometimes or whatever but other than that like he's making it easier for us with the big size i think and also putting himself in a spot where now he's got like 0.9 spr or whatever on the turn and does he really just want to jam a flush draw into a range that has a bunch of aces and just like not get it in that good I don't know. I don't know if I don't know if we want to construct a range like that. But yeah. Uh, so the fives here at fifty blinds versus small blind. Obviously, just always call that one. I think the queen ten, like we talked about, he's gonna have a bunch of give ups. He could have just turned a pair of jacks with something like I don't know, uh, jack eight of hearts or something crazy. Um, and then we'll just check that one. The fives is always. I think you don't fold any pairs here. Um, we would prefer to have the five of clubs just so that when we bank, when we bank a five, it's not a club. So we just get, get more money in, end up running. I, li I like that the club isn't so that we have the backdoor flush draw. It's so that we, it's so that we, we can make a better set. <laughs> <laughs> at, this, at this SPR, at this SPR, it doesn't matter that much, but that is a lot of the times when you continue when you continue with pairs, it's usually not about as much about like the additional equity as much as it is like like in a three bet pot if you call out a position with a pair or something. It's like when you bang off the offsuit ten, or, like, or sorry, the, I was just thinking about a hand I did it in. If you bang off the offsuit five, if you're deeper here, uh, you're just much more likely to get all the all the money in, right? Um, right, that makes sense. So yeah, and then we. So Oh, sorry. I was not to cut you off here, but we have a really interesting spot developing in top middle. Um, I, I actually, so my take on this when people take this line, this check raise, check this turn, bet this river. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and like I don't know who Antine is, but I, I'm assuming he's a reg who's like pretty balanced yeah. given this tournament. Yeah, he's a uh, good, uh, good aggressive uh, European reg. So. Okay, so then he's probably going to be pretty balanced in this spot, but but I think that a lot of a lot of weaker players will be will be fairly unbalanced here. Uh, and, and they won't have enough queens for this bet. And I mean, he is betting small. He's betting like one third pot. But it's a bit of a peculiar bet to me because you shouldn't have that many queens in your. Like, I, it strikes me as a spot where the big blind should not have much of a bet range at all. You have so few queens, and if you're going to be betting them, then 
Um, I think it's going to be hard to kind of protect yourself against uh, a button strategy that can include, I think, far more queens in the big one check raise range. I think I agree for sure. Um, and also, just for the, re- the reasons that you said, when you when you wake up with one of your bluffs or one of your queen X here, you have to shove, right? Because like you just like you don't have a ton of value. You you don't you definitely don't have enough value to be betting one third pot on a polar line, right? I mean, you're. So if he wake if he wants to go for it with something, I guess one of his one really good bluff would be maybe you don't want to have a club in your hand. He wants me to just have like missed a club and you don't want to have a pair, right? So if he check raise something like eight nine of hearts, turn goes check check, maybe just go for it seven eight of hearts, probably even better because you know you might have checked the turn a little bit. Uh, so I think you don't want clubs when you're in his spot. Uh, you also need to make me indifferent with uh, some two pairs. So, like, you got to shove, right? You can't just put out one third pot. It's a pretty easy bluff catch. I think you make a great point, too, because it's like, is he making the huge check raise? I, it's easy for us to know that he doesn't ha- have uh, the queen, high, queen high flush draw because we have it. But his queen, his predominant queen is going to be, like, queen four of clubs or whatever that he that's just a queen high that he decided he didn't want to call out a position he wanted to put in the check raise range which will almost always be like you know it's not going to be queen jack of clubs that he check raised on the flop it's just too good you want to you want to slow play it so it's going to be like a disconnected queen of clubs do you do you think for this size it's ever like a set or two pair or do you think it's only a queen i think if he wants to no like i think he's saying that he has a he has a block bet with a two pair. But if you think about his pre-flop range, he doesn't have a six off. Uh, so he's trying to say that he has like a six of spades or a six of diamonds, right? Because 10, six isn't worth this value bet. And ace 10 suited is probably shoving pre. So I think this is squarely makes sense for a six. It is still too big to be a block bet for that hand because you have an ace in your hand. Uh, I don't think that I'm going to call this bet that often with something like Jack 10. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So makes sense. I think it's, it is definitely a weird spot and I don't think he wants to have a, uh, I think maybe, he... maybe a King Jack. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to find hands that could make some sense for this size. Um, so I think we both agree that King Jack is just like way too good to check raise the flop. Right. So yeah. yeah. Um, I think he has it a lot pre-flop. He should, for sure. Other other things break down, too. Like, people shove too much pre-flop in this spot, and then their range gets really wonky um, when they start playing aggressive. Makes sense. Uh, but, yeah, I think in any case, he probably shouldn't be doing too much bluffing at all because he would have had to backdoor into a really weird queen. Okay. Like, you're not check-raising You're not check raising queen six or something and then ch- checking the turn. And I think a lot of his queen high flush draws that did check raise, if he chose to do the big size and give himself that SPR, they would jam that turn. They picked up some equity. Uh, so when we face the turn bet, I think I should always call with pairs here just because I need to defend against. First, a great regular. I should definitely always call here. So it went C bet call and then the turn here. So that three bet range at that depth should be a lot of like king queen off king jack off and also just like the suited broadways too and then this is a really easy play for them if i don't defend all my pairs that they just get to like have two clean overs to all my non asex and just bet quarter pot maybe clear out some equity versus like some spade floats or whatever and then just make if they're making me fold pairs and also just pushing a six outer i think i'm just not defending myself properly that being said i don't know if a regular that i don't recognize in a 500 has all those quarter pot third pot bluffs with two barrels um but at, at equilibrium this should be a pure call and i hope i make the call even versus uh somebody i don't know you have any thoughts on that or does i'm things- not no I, I i'm with you on, on the whole analysis i think that sounds good now we get to wait and see if i actually fall through it I understand where you're coming from, though. When you see, so like, ah, when, when like you put, it. when you when you play someone who's good, you know, you just know that they're going to be capable of of uh, of a decent portion of bluffs here. But when you face some random guy who you haven't seen any of the uh, of the other, of your other tournaments, who might not be very good, um, it it gets a lot dicier pretty quick. So I, I can yeah. kind of understand maybe making that making it a little bit more conservative of a fold here against a player that 
a, a, a player that you haven't seen. Yeah. Even if we don't learn anything about the defending range uh, there, I think that just just knowing to find that bluff is super important. Take away from that hand if, when you're the out of position player, like finding that king queen queen jack jack ten like. I've, not not rocket science to figure out that like you've got two good blockers to the when you have queen jack or jack 10 or king jack you get right. some good good kicker blockers and stuff but i think maybe maybe some some middle stakes guys uh don't find enough bluffs on the like an ace ace x board in a three bit pop because it seems like the other guy it's a it's a spot where it's a little bit more difficult to find bluffs i think for sure, I, and you know, you think about hands like, um, like maybe like a queen jack of of diamonds or whatever might be a really nice triple hand. Whereas like a, uh, some kind of like queen ten of clubs could be like a nice bet bet check fold hand. Yeah, that's um, a, that's a good thing about the spot too. Is just that, uh, yeah, you don't want to you can you can bet your clubs twice and just kind of be actually value betting flop and turn and then give up because you don't want to. Inc- you know you're going to be waiting them more towards calls and then the other ones that you're just like barreling and when the club draw misses you you really get a lot of auto folds so it's a good point point. Yep. and then if you barrel the uh then you have the the in between where you barrel the king of clubs queen give yourself something to bluff with when uh the flush comes in and you still get to follow through with that one sometimes because you only have the one club blocker right so so we open the threes. We're low jack. Uh, I think that's the worst pair we open and prob. Eh, I mean, like it is lineup dependent, right? So like, I'm comfortable op- basically just always opening threes and low jack at a hundred blinds. Uh, I think twos is a fold, and I think like technically maybe fours is the first pure open and threes you fold sometimes, but. So spots like spots like that are just never that interesting though because it's like what is the real like. Like the value between playing your pocket three is perfectly and not playing your pocket three is perfectly as a pre pop open is like so marginal. It's yeah, not it's really... just it's just indifferent. Doesn't matter. Yeah, so yeah. I think we always want to bet this flop with our range. Not I mean almost always. Uh, and I think um, that's something that I notice when I play against uh, not like going from playing against all those super high roller regs that like are the best ones to almost never miss these c bets that are with range. I think a lot of people uh, miss... I'm not saying you can't check, like, queens here or jacks here or whatever, but in general, we have the tight range. We're going up against a range that's very suited in nature in the big blind. It's got a lot of uh, middling offsuit stuff, like the jack-10 off or whatever that just has to fold here, except for maybe it continues a little bit with the heart, but probably not versus low jack. And you get a lot of folds from those spade and uh, diamond combos that are what makes up a big bulk of his range. So... In any case, we have a nice tight range. It's a king high board, which is good for in position. And uh, we want to take advantage of it by being really aggressive with a high frequency C bet, mostly small, maybe a little bit of big big size here. Um, and the threes with a heart is definitely going to be one that we want to bet for maximum protection and just get those folds. And we get to use it to barrel sometimes. Totally agree. Totally agree. And that's what you, you see at World Series and stuff like that. Like people, they miss the the early aggression on like a lot of spots. People over C bet, but a lot of these like pure C bets they miss it, and then they're really lacking for bluffs on a lot of runouts later on, <clears throat> or bluffs that aren't obvious. Well, what do you think about this hand as a bluff? Uh, yeah, I think I should be doing this. So I think I should be running one with this one a lot. Um, when I am this tight pre-flop meaning like not this type of like low jack 20 22 percent pre i think it's not a spot where i have to be crazy cautious at 100 blinds that the uh big blind has a flush just because like i i have a a bunch of flushes too my opening range is very suited even though i did see that quite wide on the flop on the turn i can split it's not like i'm gonna go crazy bluffing with uh non-heart combos I probably have my like ace 10 ace queen with hearts here with one single heart and then these small pocket pairs the reason why i kind of like so like the ace 10 and ace queen with the heart obviously you just have more equity uh you have some nut equity and then the for the threes you have the thing going for you where like 
when you don't have any of the queen, 10, nine, whatever in your hand, you're just increasing your folds on the turn, right? So like, right. This, this I, hit, yeah. Also, just to jump in here, I, I also feel like this is a situation where um, a lot of players will, will under bluff because they see this spot and they might see threes and say, like, okay, well, I have some showdown value and I, I, I obviously I have like a little bit of playability on some rivers, so I might just check this take my showdown value. But like the the range you're opening pre matters substantially here, right? You know, if you're opening right. a button range, then you don't really have to search that hard to find unpaired, um, you know, mid to high card hearts that you might want to be bluffing with. But when we look at a low jack open range, okay, yeah, sure. So we have ace queen with a heart, uh, or um, uh, ace ten with a heart. But what other offsuit hands with a heart are worse than threes here? Like none, right. possibly none, probably none. So we have like our third worst, you know, just from a pure, pure ranking, purely linear, like a showdown perspective, um, our third worst hand that can even contain a heart. So I don't feel that attached to having to, you know, play this as a check and maybe go for some kind of showdown play. Uh, whereas I might feel that way if it was like blind versus blind or button versus big blind, like those types of situations. Right, for sure. And I mean, like the three blocker is relevant when the guy has every suited three, you know, I mean, yep, totally. it's, it's definitely eliminating some flushes. The other thing I think that's easy to forget when you kind of get the blinders on in these bluff spots, especially like this is whatever early stages in a re-entry, right? So like, it's not that hard to find it, but like, it's easy to start thinking like, Oh, this, the big blind has so many flushes like this, but he also just has like King eight off and seven, nine, and you know what I mean? Like there's just so right. many, when you add up all these offsuit hands, uh, all the seven X that has immediate folds, all of his like eights through tens that aren't three betting preflop versus slow Jack. I mean, yeah, I think it's easy to, to kind of get the blinders and think you shouldn't bluff too much here, but yeah, you don't want to go crazy, but I think we, yeah, with the, like we said, the hands, we said the small pocket pairs with the heart and the, uh, ace queen, ace 10 are going to make up, but like the ace queen, ace 10, you know, then you start blocking some pairs that you're targeting with folds and you start, you know, they got, you kind of want the guy to have like a seven ace of hearts when you go for three streets. So both, both categories of bluffs have their, yeah, I think I like you, around, you, you, you never want to have the blinders on. No, the blinders are bad.